Another way we can look at evolution is to compare early stages of different organisms, the embryos. Uh, so if we compare all vertebrates, vertebrates, although as adults, look very different from fish, reptiles, uh, everything with a bony backbone. So that would, with the, uh, that would include fish, reptiles, birds, mammals, us. Um, all vertebrates pass through a very similar stage in early development called the pharyngeal arch stage or the pharyngealis stage. And in fish, these arches go on to form gills. And we can see these slitted gill structures, uh, especially in more primitive fish like sharks. Uh, those slit gills are right on the surface of the adult. And here's a human embryo over here and at that same stage, and we can see these gill arches in a human embryo. Uh, at the same stage, human embryo also has a tail, which will later be reabsorbed in almost, all, almost everybody. So what are these pharyngeal uh, arches doing in all the vertebrates other than fish, uh, vertebrates that don't have gills, like birds? This is probably a chick. Uh, chicken embryo, usually when they say bird, that's what it is. Reptile, this is probably a lizard of some kind. Um, these arches go on to form parts of our upper and lower jaw. They form parts of the structures in our neck, like your larynx. They form two of the three little bones inside of your ear. Um, they form the, the slit in between two of these arches forms the eustachian tube. Your eustachian tube is that little tube that connects your middle ear to your throat. It's what you pop when you're uh, equalizing pressure in your ears, like on an airplane or something. Uh, that is the slit in between two of these arches during embryonic stages. So the fact that all vertebrates have this similar stage, even though there are many vertebrates today that don't have gills, is an indication that all vertebrates have a common ancestor, and that ancestor, the common ancestor of all vertebrates, was a fish. Uh, so human embryos, here's a, um, an, a cartoonish uh, depiction of that pharyngeal stage for all the different vertebrates, reptiles, birds, and two mammals, and the gills arches are highlighted here. Um, so human embryos also have a tail at this stage, uh, as do other vertebrates, which is normally reabsorbed. Uh, there's all a kidney function and our kidney structure and heart structure also goes through similar stages. So the first functional kidney in a human embryo is a fish-like kidney. The second functional kidney in a human embryo is more of a reptilian type of a kidney. And then finally, the vertebrate, or the um, mammalian kidney, is the one that forms before birth. Um, and the heart as well. The first uh, heart in a human embryo is two tubes of contractile tissue that later fuse and bend and form the four chambered heart that we have. So uh, in embryonic development, we can see some of the earlier evolutionary stages. Um, if we're going to talk about structures that are the same in different organisms, we want to differentiate between structures that are homologous. So structures that are the same because an ancestor also had that structure. Uh, and structures that look similar but are in fact evolved independently, which we would call that uh, those structures analogous. So they look similar because of similar selective pressure. Uh, we call that convergent evolution, things converging on the same solution to a problem, not because of shared ancestry. So for homologous structure, so here's a human foot and a chimpanzee foot, uh, function very diff differently, as we'll talk about in the next chapter, human evolution. Uh, feet are adapted for walking and running. Chimpanzee foot is adapted for tree climbing. They have an opposable big toe, which we don't have. Our big toe is in line with the rest of our toes. Uh, but if you look at the bones and the muscles in a human foot and a chimpanzee foot, they're the same. 
uh, we have the same muscles and bones. They're just arranged differently and function differently. So the bones and muscles in a human foot and a chimpanzee foot are homologous. They're homologous because they're derived from the same body part in a common ancestor. So our common ancestor with chimpanzees lived about 8 million years ago and also had feet with the same bones and muscles. Now if we compare a human foot to a fly foot, flies also use their feet for walking. So similar selective pressure. They sort of superficially look like a human foot. However, it isn't any similarities are analogous. Uh, and in fact, are the result of convergent evolution, the same selective pressure needing to be useful for walking. Uh, has created a roughly similar overall structure, but our common ancestor which fly, with flies, which we do have one, you have to go back much further ago than 8 million years ago though, our common ancestor with flies would have been before the Cambrian explosion, so at least 600 million years ago, that ancestor did not have feet or walk. So. Uh, any superficial similarities are the result of convergent evolution, not because of shared descent. So uh, it's from similar selective pressure. So the same uh, selective pressure for walking. Uh, if we look at mammalian forelimb, so forelimb is an F-O-R-E, forelimb. Uh, those are our arms, uh, or the front legs on other uh, tetrapods. Our legs are hind limbs of tetrapods. So if we compare the forelimbs, these are uh, very specialized forelimbs. Our forelimb, is, our arm, is much more like the ancestral uh, tetrapod. So tetrapods are all the four-legged land animals. So that includes amphibians like frogs and salamanders, reptiles, birds, uh, and mammals, and dinosaurs as well, although they're extinct. So our forelimb is much more generalized and, and looks much more like the primitive first amphibians that walked on land. And we can see this, this bone structure that will be repeated of one bone, two bones, some little bones, and then five digits. Uh, the number of digits has varied over the course of tetrapod evolution. There are uh, early tetrapods with seven or nine digits as well. Uh, our, di our forelimbs are rather generalized, which is why we can do so many different things with them. Um, bats are mammals, and they uh, are the only mammals that can fly that have evolved true flight. There are gliding mammals, like flying squirrels that don't really have powered flight. Uh, and again, we have the one bone and the two bones. One of these bones is greatly reduced. Little bones and then digits. And they use their digits for supporting this uh, skin flap that's their, uh, that they use for flight. They only really use their thumbs for, uh, as a digit anymore. Uh, and they use those for climbing and hanging onto things. Now on the other end here, porpoise are small toothed whales, and this same thing would be true for all cetaceans, everything in the whale group. Uh, and inside there, they've lost their hind limbs, as we talked about earlier, but their forelimbs, we can still see the same ancestral tetrapod condition inside. So they still have that one bone, two bones, wrist bones, and five digits inside of their flipper. Uh, horse here has very specialized forelimbs for running and but we can still see that ancestral condition of one bone two bones wrist bones and then digits and so horses walk on their middle digits the first and the fifth digits have been completely lost and the second and the fourth digits are greatly reduced so we sh i showed you a slide earlier where one of these digits had uh, was large and like an actual digit, and that is not that rare in horses. And so we can see one of those little digits there. So you can see why uh, horses break their legs so often 
um, very precarious. And so uh, evolution only, natural selection only has the mutations that occur to select from. So sometimes solutions uh, to an evolutionary problem have a downside as well. Um, a vet once told me that horses are one bad stomach on four bad legs because that's usually what kills a horse. But we inside here we can see these similar bone structures and what this indicates is these, these are homologous because the common ancestor of all mammals had the same bones. And so even though they are specialized for very different purposes, there was a common ancestor that had this same one bone, two bones, wrist bones, and digits. Uh, and that's why these are all similar. So they are homologous. Um, if we look at a tree here of vertebrates, so this is uh, the vertebrates and one um, uh, the vertebrates, or I should say tetrapods, and their outgroup here. So all vertebrates. Uh, when we draw a tree like this, the branch points represent a new trait, something that one branch lacks and the other branch has. So in this case, each one of these branch points represents uh, an invention, a new uh, trait that evolved in the vertebrate lineage. So the first branch point here was being tetrapods. So our first, uh, so it says digit bearing limbs. So the first land vertebrates who were not fish were amphibians, uh, which now the amphibians that exist today are frogs, salamanders, and another weird group, the Sicilians, which most people haven't heard of. Uh, Lungfish are the outgroup because these are in the same group as the coelacanth that I showed you earlier, the lobe-finned fish. They have fleshy, um, uh, limb-like fins, and they are the closest fish relative of the tetrapods. Then, between amphibians and the rest of vertebrates, the rest of the tetrapods, it says amnion. So what that means is eggs that could be laid on land. So amphibians have to lay their eggs in water. They don't have a shell. They just are coated with uh, jelly that doesn't hold on to water. So they have to lay their eggs in either directly in water or in extremely wet environments. Uh, but the reptiles now had an egg with a shell that could resist desiccation. So they did not have to lay their eggs in water. They could lay their eggs on land, which meant that they could exploit new environments, new uh, ecological niches. Uh, then we have the next split here for mammals. Now, what would be this split point? Because there are mammals that lay eggs. There's a few, there's only a few species left. But what that indicates is the first mammals laid eggs. And there's still a few species today that do, like the platypus uh, in Australia and the spiny anteater um, lay eggs. So what distinguishes all mammals is uh, that they feed their babies milk. Uh, and they uh, also have fur for warmth. So that's this split here. And now if we go up here, now we have reptiles, lizards, and snakes. And then we have another split point here that leads to crocodiles and birds. And so that implies that dinosaurs are here as well. So they're not shown on this particular lineage, but we can see feathers here. We already talked about how theropod dinosaurs, at least maybe other dinosaur groups as well, that's not clear yet, but certainly all the theropod dinosaurs had feathers. So that's a split point here. And now we have the descendants of the theropod dinosaurs are all of the birds. You notice ostriches are on their own branch here because they are um, they have a lot of weird features. Uh, so crocodiles are the, clo other than birds, crocodiles are the closest living relatives to um, dinosaurs today. Uh, so the example I showed with the four mammalian limbs, that's an example of homologous, of homologous structures. But what about 
analogous. So uh, this is one of my favorite examples of convergent evolution. So uh, convergent evolution is the evolution of similar looking traits or features that are due to the same selection pressure acting on different groups. And so they come to resemble each other in particular traits like cactus-like plants evolving both in uh, North American deserts and in Asian deserts from very unrelated groups of plants, but they come to resemble each other because in the desert, the scarcity of water is a strong selection pressure. It's going to drive similar traits to appear by convergent evolution, but those traits are going to be analogous. So on the left here, we have a dolphin. Uh, again, they're a small toothed whale. They are in the same uh, group as whales. And on the right here is an ichthyosaur. This is not a dinosaur. This was a species of marine reptile that lived during the age of the dinosaurs. Ichthys means fish and sore is lizard. So ichthyosaur literally means fishy lizard. And you, can no you notice a great many similarities. Um, they have a long snout full and a mouthful of sharp teeth. Um, probably had a similar diet to what dolphins have today, which is that they eat fish. Um, and you'll notice that the, this species as well lost its uh, land limbs, and because it's a it's a reptile, so it's descended from a four-legged land reptile. Uh, still breathed the air. Uh, nostrils for cetaceans are on the top of their head. Also for the ichthyosaur, nostrils are on top of the head. Um, they both evolved a dorsal fin. Now think for a minute, this is definitely an analogous structure. So uh, mammals generally don't have dorsal fins, neither do reptiles. It evolved independently in these two groups uh, because of the selection of needing to swim fast in a marine environment. So what does a dorsal fin do? It has the same function as the keel of a ship. It pretend, pre prevents rotation during rapid swimming. Uh, fish species that live on the bottom and don't swim rapidly often don't have a dorsal fin either. So dorsal fins are for stability during rapid swimming and to prevent rotation. So that evolved independently. So these two structures, the dorsal fins, are analogous. Uh, they did not evolve from, they did, were not present in a common ancestor. The common ancestor of uh, mammals and reptiles would have been uh, a reptile that lived at the beginning of the age of the dinosaurs, um, did not have a dorsal fin and lived on land. Now, one of the ways we can tell that this is convergent evolution is the details are different. So ichthyosaurs still had a reduced hind limb, uh, cetaceans no hind limb. Uh, cetaceans move their tail up and down when they swim. Ichthyosaurs move their tail side to side like a fish. So when the details are different, that's another indication that this is the result of convergent evolution and not the result of inheritance from a common ancestor. Um, convergent evolution has also occurred when it comes to flight. So flight has evolved three times in vertebrates. Two of those groups of vertebrates are still extant today. One is extinct. So birds uh, evolved flight early in their evolution and their separation from the theropod dinosaurs. They use feathers to support uh, flight. Bats still around today, as we already talked about, instead of feathers, they use digits to support a flap of skin and lack feathers. Um, pterosaurs, which are extinct, they also used one digit to support a skin flap. So the details here are different. The common ancestor of pterosaurs and bats would have been uh, a reptile that did not fly. So uh, these are, although they are sort of similar on the surface, these three types of flight are analogous and evolved independently. They, these three types of organisms don't fly because they had a common ancestor who could also fly. So that's an indication that this is convergent evolution. Um, we can also see this when we look at distantly related types of mammals. So we have three types of mammals, three big groups of mammals, the 
uh, egg-laying mam mammals or monotremes, which includes the, the very few species today, uh, duck-billed platypus, which lives in Australia, and the spiny anteater as well. Uh, and then we have marsupial mammals. So marsupials live in, most, most of them are in Australia and New Zealand, and they do not have a placenta for supporting fetal growth internally. Instead, they have to give birth to very tiny, immature babies that then crawl their way into the pouch of the female, uh, latch onto a teat, and stay there for weeks or months as kind of a second pregnancy. Um, so those are the marsupials. And the marsupials include kangaroos, uh, wallabies, koala bears. Uh, those are probably the most familiar ones that you've heard of. Uh, we have one marsupial mammal here in North America who you've probably all seen. They're not endangered. They're quite common. They, uh, you might have seen this particular one getting into your garbage. Uh, they look sort of like a really big rat, uh, but they're not closely related to rats at all. And that is, can you think of what it is? That would be the possum. So possums are, or opossums, are uh, our only native marsupial. So we are members of the placental mammals. Placental mammals occur all over the world. And most of the mammals that are familiar to you, dogs and cats, primates, uh, seals, cows, goats, uh, mice, rats, all of those are uh, placental mammals. And placental mammals have evolved the placenta for feeding larger embryos and fetuses internally so that uh, offspring could be kept internally for longer. And offspring that are kept internally are safer then if you lay eggs, if you lay eggs, you have to guard the eggs or carry them around with you. Uh, and this was uh, a significant evolutionary adaptation, and it was also very successful because, as uh, we can see today, placental mammals are the most successful, and that would include us. We're placental mammals. But if we compare mammals, uh, marsupial mammals in Australia and placental mammals who don't live in Australia, we see similar adaptations for the same ecological niche. So we have a mouse, uh, mice are rodents, they're related to uh, rats and squirrels, which are also rodents. Uh, in Australia, they have a mouse-like marsupial that has the same ecological niche. They're nocturnal. They eat insects and seeds. Um, they live in burrows in the ground. They're very small, uh, but it's not at all closely related to rodents. It's no more closely related than mice are to kangaroos, for example. Uh, so the similarities that we see are analogous and due to convergent evolution. The same with flying squirrels and uh, sugar gliders. They're and flying phalangers. They're older name. We call them sugar gliders now that they're in the pet industry. That sounds nicer. But they both have skin flaps that they use to leap from tree to tree. Uh, but these structures are completely analogous and due to convergent evolution. And flying squirrels aren't any more closely related to uh, sugar gliders than they are to kangaroos. Um, they're also used to be large carnivorous marsupials. They are all extinct. The only one that's still around is a smaller one, the Tasmanian Devil, that you might have heard of. Uh, they actually still exist, although they are endangered at this time. But superficially, they're very similar to the Canids. So uh, convergent evolution on a similar body form, similar lifestyle, except for uh, these large marsupial carnivores had a pouch like a kangaroo, kept their babies uh, in the pouch after they were born as tiny little embryos. Um, and again, only the females have a pouch. Uh, sometimes that seems to be misunderstood by people who aren't familiar with uh, marsupials. So when things look really similar uh, and it's convergent evolution at play, there's another method we can use to double check whether what we're looking at is two species that are very closely related or two very distantly related species that just look similar due to convergent evolution. And that method is called the molecular clock method. 
and it uses sequenced DNA. And this method has become very, very widely used in the last 20 years as cheap DNA sequencing has become available. Uh, each gene mutates at its own rate. Uh, the more important the gene, the slower it accumulates mutations. Uh, genes that are that can uh, are less critical mutate at a higher rate, and what that means is they don't mutations occur at the same rate everywhere in the genome. But if the gene is crucially important, like the cytochrome C gene in mitochondria, uh, mutations that occur there are much more likely to be fatal. So we just don't see them. Um, something like a DNA polymerase is going to, that replicates the DNA is a crucially important enzyme. So it's going to mutate at a very slow rate. The molecular clock is going to tick at a slow rate. But something like the uh, globin genes that are part of hemoglobin, well, mutations can accumulate more easily there. And it's just because mutations are more survivable. Uh, there. So uh, when you're going to compare different organisms, you pick one gene to use as a comparison. If you're comparing very distantly related things like marsupial and placental mammals, you would use a gene that mutates at a slower rate. If you're comparing, for example, all of the uh, primates, which are all much more closely related, you would use something like globin genes, which mutate at a more rapid rate. So uh, what we have here on the y-axis is the number of differences in the actual DNA sequence. So remember, DNA is made of individual nucleotides. When we sequence the DNA, that means we're just determining what that exact nucleotide sequence is. And we can compare different organisms. And of course, we have to use computers for this because their uh, genes are, have so many nucleotides in them. Uh, and you can determine exactly how many nucleotides are different, and that's what substitutions means. How many are different between these two species? And that's related to how long ago they were a common ancestor. So what millions of years ago, what this means is, when was the last time those two versions of that gene were one gene? And that we can, if we have any um, fossil evidence at all, we can then pin a number line onto the x-axis here uh, and determine how long ago things separated. And if we look here, if we compare uh, cytochrome C gene in horses and versus donkeys or sheep versus goats, which are very closely related species, we find a very, very few nucleotide differences. And it would be the same if we compared humans and chimpanzees, which are very closely related. We would find, if we did, it's not on this graph, but if we did human versus chimpanzee, it would also be way down here because we're very closely related. If we compare things that are more distantly related, like humans versus rodent, and rodent here would certainly be mouse, um, we find many more substitutions. And our common ancestor, primates and rodents then separated while the dinosaurs were still alive. So mammal evolution was already occurring during the age of the dinosaurs. And that's kind of a new piece of information too. Uh, 40, 50 years ago, it was thought that the dinosaurs were around, there weren't any mammals, and then sometime toward the end of the age of the dinosaurs, mammals first appeared, uh, the dinosaurs went extinct, and then mammals took over. And now we know that, in fact, mammals were around almost the entire time the dinosaurs were around. And fossil evidence now supports this. Uh, really ancient mammalian fossils have now been found. Uh, and we've pieced this together a little bit more. But so if we compare humans and kangaroos, kangaroos are marsupials, so very distantly related from placental mammals, we get a separation time of 125 million years ago, which is right smack in the middle of the age of the dinosaurs. So this supports the fossil evidence that we've also found of ancient uh, mammal-like uh, species that lived during the early part even of the age of the dinosaurs. So uh, really good to have two different types of evidence that both kind of converge on the same answer. Um, so for really old DNA, we're never going to have it. So the oldest DNA that's ever been sequenced and found was about 700,000 years old, and so less than a million years old. Um, but 
a lot of interesting species went extinct way longer ago than that. Dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago. All those ancient whales went extinct uh, 40, 50 million years ago. We're never going to have their DNA. DNA just doesn't last that long. Uh, so what can we do? How can we figure out what their DNA sequences might have been? Well, we can use the same molecular clock comparison and look at the differences between two species that exist today and kind of track back like what was the probable DNA sequence in the common ancestor that random mutations would have ended up with the sequences that we see today. So uh, that's one thing that we can do because we'll never have this ancient DNA. Uh, it just would not be preserved that long. Even if it was frozen solid, it's not going to last uh, more than a million years.